Hey, it's, so, sorry for the delay. Thanks all for uh, being very patient. And we are really very happy and uh, very privileged to uh, have Dr. Ted Bestman from University of South Carolina as our speaker. I'm pretty sure everyone who's logged in has already seen his CV, his bio. So I'm not going to go through that uh, for the sake of time. But uh, Dr. Ted Bestman's done so much work in the area of computational thermodynamics and nuclear fuels that you know I'm, I'm pretty sure just based on the abstract that it's going to be a great learning experience for all of us. So without further ado, the floor is yours, Ted. Thanks a lot. Thank, thank you. Good. Nothing like raising expectations. <laughs> um, you know, also that you know this tech. I mean, I I went all through school almost on, uh, using a slide rule. So. Uh, Still, still challenged by by the tech. <clears throat> so, uh, talk today a little bit about molten salt reactors and thermochemical model. Give you a little a brief history of molten salt reactors. Uh, talk about modeling simulation needs and why we want to have system thermal property databases. Methodology for getting thermochemical functions from salts, modeling their behavior in complex systems. Some examples of computer phase equilibria, phase pressure corrosion potential, and then the uh, information about the publicly accessible databases. Try right, clicking the uh, middle first and then press down. The what? Just click the slide first and then oh, press okay. down. Thank you. Okay, bone salt reactor concept. You all know details, right? <laughs> well, in in the forties, <laughs> um, you all you all remember the forties, right? Um, the Manhattan Project scientists, uh, the, the Nobel laureates Harold Urey and, and, and Gene Wigner, said that reactors really aren't mechanical engineering devices, they're chemical engineering devices, and fuel should be a liquid. Um, and molten salts were really attractive. They have high solubility for reactinides, they're stable thermodynamically, good heat transfer capabilities, very high boiling points, so they have low vapor pressures. Compatible with the nickel based structural alloys and with graphite, and they would be compatible with chemical processing. And they're transparent. And, and here you see there's a lithium beryllium fluoride salt, it's a solid, and here it's heated up, and you can see it's a liquid and it's relatively clear. And why do they care if it's clear? Well, that's another mechanism for heat transfer, radiative heat transfer. So the first thought was aircraft nuclear propulsion. <clears throat> Put a reactor in, a, in an aircraft and you can fly for weeks. So the US military was very interested in that <clears throat> because in the uh, late 40s, you know, we are uh, in the Cold War with the USSR and we had to be ready to send our fleet of bombers over there. Unfortunately, the bombers of the era uh, could not make the trip and return on a tank of gas, which meant the trip was one way, landing in third country after a mission. They had started in-flight refueling, but it was risky, it wasn't perfected. There was... Uh, no, at that point, no other means for, develop, for delivering nuclear weapons to Russia. So the idea, let's, let's develop a reactor. We can put an airplane and it'll power the airplane. So the, that launched the aircraft nuclear propulsion program. Turn the map. So at Oak Ridge National Lab, they built a small reactor to investigate the possibility of running an airplane with a reactor, fuel with sodium fluoride, zirconium fluoride, uranium fluoride as a liquid, 
And here you can see um, react, reactor, small reactor under construction. Here's the top's finished. So the uh, schematic. Here's the uh, mock up flow, flow diagram. And so the heat at that point, we would just dissipate the heat, you know, because it's just a demonstration. And the thing worked, ran for nine days on and off, got about 74 hours at 860 centigrade, generated 2.5 megawatts thermal. And it was doomed. Oh. I can tell you the reasons why it was doomed. Basically, uh, weight, you're irradiating the crew. So if you're not going if you're not, if you're not gonna irradiate the crew, weighs even more. And so, and at the same time, other options arose. ICBMs were developed so we can deliver nuclear uh, weapons to, to Russia by different means, submarines, and in-flight in refueling became uh, a regular uh, activity. So that was the end of the aircraft nuclear propulsion program. But Oak Ridge National Laboratory Director Alvin Weinberg thought this is a great idea for making power. So he, he got the molten salt reactor experiment funded. They started construction in 1962 and they went critical in 1965, which is remarkable. Can't do anything that fast anymore. It operated for several years with various options and fuel and demonstrated uh, considerable capability for reactor. Here is uh, some just details. Uh, here is the top of, of the reactor cell. Here is the, you can see the reactor vessel right here. This is a contemporary picture. It's still sitting there in Oak Ridge. Nobody's run it in 50 years. And so they just haven't gotten around to cleaning it up. That project ended because then Atomic Energy Commission, which became the Department of Energy, decided that it had other priorities. It was no longer going to uh, support the molten salt reactor experiment. So that program ended in the 70s. And then about 15 years ago, there was a new interest in MSRs. They can handle uh, the uranium plutonium or thorium uranium fuel cycle if you want to generate new fuel. You can consume transuranic elements, which are a long lived component of nuclear waste. Again, use fluorides or chlorides, either as a fuel carrier salt or just the coolant. It can be relatively flexible. You can make small reactors. 100 to 400 megawatt electric is considered a small reactor today. Large scale reactors, folks, light, light water reactors, folks build about 1200 megawatts electric. There are now programs in a number of countries. And here's a little chart I, I generated after a, one in a report the other day. So we have a whole raft of thermal reactors, approaches, fast reactor approaches, fluorides and chlorides, a whole bunch of companies, a whole bunch of national programs are underway to develop molten salt reactors. Some developers say we're going, they're going to have their first reactor operating uh, in, within the decade. It's a remarkably short period of time. <clears throat> Understanding how these things behave is tremendously complex. Uh, what you have is, you have, uh, you have the reactor core. So let's say we have fuel dissolved in, in a fluoride salt circulating in a system for some period of time. It's gonna be in a configuration where it, you can sustain a nuclear chain reaction. And then the, the, the fluid flows out into a pipe configurations does no longer allow you to sustain a nuclear chain reaction and you go around exchange heat out of the out of the cool out of the fuel with coolant and then it goes back into the core region fission occurs blah blah blah, blah. it's going around in this loop so here's the loop you got less than 30 seconds in the core less than 30 seconds in the heat transfer loop and it's just going around and around <clears throat> so you're developed you're 
fissioning within uh, the reactor core region, and you're generating uh, the order of 2,000 isotopes, different isotopes. About 60 different elements are being generated as a result of fission. And here's just an interesting decay chain. So you have the iodine-137 is a result of fission. It's soluble in the salt. In 25 second half life, it's going to be xenon 137. It's a gas. Four minute half life, it's going to be cesium 137. It's a soluble salt. And similar chains with zirconium, cadmium isotopes, etc. So not only are you fissioning here, are you splitting the atom and generating new elements, they're constantly changing. And their chemical behavior is a function of what is that particular chemical element at that particular moment in the loop. So you got the neutron physics guys uh, are just thrilled because they got so much work to do. If we want to understand the reactor, we have to have a set of models for it. And so right now in the Nuclear Energy Advanced Modeling Simulation Program under DOE, we have folks working on reactor physics codes, thermal hydraulics codes, codes to model surface corrosion, multi-species transport, and that is all informed by what is the thermochemical state. In other words, what are the phases present in the system? What are the melting points? What are the solubilities, et cetera? What are the chemical potentials? And that's what we work on, providing information to determine the thermochemical state. Why is it important? Well, it's important because we're doing it. Basically, thermo we're developing thermochemical models gives energy functions. Salts can be near equilibrium. High temperature, kinetics are rapid. So liquid transports rapid. So it's going to be, its, it's state is going to be governed by its Gibbs energies. Right. At, at low, uh, you know, at the, at the minimum Gibbs energy, we have the equilibrium state. So if we calculate that, that gives us a local composition, speciation, whatever phases that might precipitate, phase formation, what are they? Chemical potentials, so we want to control redox for corrosion and transport, provide input for phase fuel calculations for the solid materials to understand corrosion and vapor pressures, both for understanding the vapors uh, above the, the reactor core and also as source terms for accident analysis. In order to do that, you need an accurate database. You have to have the thermodynamic functions for everything. And that you dump those all to an equilibrium minimizer, gives energy minimizer, and out at minimum free energy comes your equilibrium state. To do that, we are building the molten salt thermal properties database. There are two of them. One's a thermophysical, one's a thermochemical. My side of the operations is thermochemical consists of a library of Gibbs functions with relevant solution models for solid and liquid and vapor species. And we're using ChemSage format for FaxAge, the thermochemical codes, et cetera. Um, talking briefly a little bit about that later, there's also a companion thermophysical database, and that's being led by uh, Diane Zell and Tony Beery at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. These are the base salts. So uh, we developed a program roadmap and Roadmap looked at all the developers that are working on molten salt reactors. What are the systems they're interested in? And these are the systems. So we have the chlorides, the zirconium, potassium, aluminum, thorium, uranium, plutonium, et cetera, magnesium chloride, and fluorides, something called FLOD, lithium beryllium fluoride, lithium sodium fluoride, et cetera. So those are the base systems. So we have to have to understand these in, at, in the, at the minimum. That means generating a database. First thing you want to do is not do any work. So you do my, data mining. Who's done it already? And is it any good? Is it consistent? Is it consistent with our models? Excuse me. How do we do that data mining? Just by looking the Studies Read literature. literature, just dive into literature. I have a postdoc 
who can find the most obscure Russian references. And, and they, the Russians do wonderful work, especially high temperature chemistry. They are superb and uh, got so much good information from them. Manually just by looking the papers probably? Yeah. Or? And, uh, you know, uh, and even if it's in Russian, you, your data numbers are numbers, you know, so, but we, and Google, translates to Russian. <laughs> and then I have Russian colleagues, so we, we make sure that we're not doing something stupid. Um, uh, you know, th then at last resort, <laughs> there's first principle calculations, um, and they can, they're they actually very useful. We can <coughs> at least get trends. We can get free energy formations for crystalline phases, uh, and at least as a starting point, uh, important are coordination numbers for, for uh, the molten salts. So there's a lot of work on computing those. Uh, last resort is experimental determination of, of key values. Why is that last resort? Because it's expensive. It's time consuming, but you have to do it if you don't have other, in other information. So we do differential scanning calorimetry, uh, room and high temperature XRD, and all of that information then goes into uh, CalFAD modeling. So we model the phases, the solid solutions phases, the liquid melt, and we get values for the compounds, stoichiometric compounds, vapor species, et cetera. The kind of information is just, you know, high temperature XRD, DSC, so DSC curves. Um, salts, these salts are extremely sensitive to moisture and oxygen, so least bit of contamination screws them up. You get polymerization, etc. If you get the melting, if the melting point's right, the salt is good. So, because it's it's a very strong effect. So here's a, a DSC curve, and then we often have to do correlations. We don't have the, the exact information for a system, but we have information for related systems. Modeling molten salt is uh, is is challenging. If you're going to do it from a first principles point of view, you're doing things like ab initio molecular dynamics, extremely computationally expensive, and uh, you're not too sure all the time whether you got it right. On the other hand, very simple solution models, ideal solution, regular solutions, don't capture the short range order you see in molten salts, where you have different, different coordinate coordinations depending on temperature and composition. And so, we're using the modified quasi-chemical model in the quadruplet approximation, which is a good compromise. It you you ge generate these quadruplets. You can, you can have multiple quadruplets, or you can have multiple coordination numbers and mix, allow them all to mix I ideally or with, or with some interaction parameters. And that does a reasonably good job of capturing the short range order in the thermodynamic functions. Um, it's an approximation certainly, but it works quite well. So here's an example of an optimization. Let's get rid of this thing. Um, how do you hide this? Um, if you hit the more button, there might be an option. Uh, hide video camera. Uh, this right. There we go. Okay. So here's an example of an optimization. The optimization is take all the information you can find and you develop models for the phases that reproduce those values. And then you know you got it right. So Sodium chloride, uranium trichloride, we call that pseudo binary system. Uh, we needed to understand that well. It's one of the base systems. We did differential scaling calorimetry at different compositions. And it turns out that uh, doing Taman analysis, it turns out you have an indication of a intermediate compound that <clears throat> folks have not identified previously. It's not a simple eutectic system. So that raised red flag. We looked at transitions. We see you know, these, these artifacts in the differential scan and calorimetry scans at different temperatures. 
and more evidence. Turns out that the ionization potential ratios between rare earth or lanthanide chlorides and sodium chloride, the range of those ionization potential ratios give you an indication of whether you've got a single intermediate phase or multiple intermediate phases. Turns out for UCL3 and NaCl3, we are in the range for a single intermediate phase. And then we did high temperature XRD on the salts, and we see uh, evidence of an intermediate phase um, at elevated temperatures. It's not a room temperature phase. Take that, all that together, plus all these little points here are phase diagram measurements, um, determinations of liquidus solidus, and transitions. So all this information together allowed us to optimize the system. Here you can see in, in the red and blue triangles is our measurements. And then there's a, those of uh, Krauss and Subi and some old r and L work. The diagram is our comp computed diagram based on our models. So there's the computed diagram and there's the data. Pretty darn good. Here, and here is our intermediate compound. And we're not sure, but we're hypothesizing that it's sodium U2Cl7. So it's an example of one of the more uh, um, uh, involved in the optimizations of the system. When data is scarce, we need to do things like correlations. So uh, Giuliano, Sean Pinto, and Jacob Yingling in my group uh, used the Davis estimation for heat of mixing. <clears throat> So what we did, we just, we, uh, there's a structure factor based on the relative ionic radii for the components um, and versus uh, short range order. Uh, the, the short range order at, at which the uh, free energy is a, for the solution is a minimum. And so there's a correlation. Turns out just about, just about linear, somewhat quadratic or near linear correlation for very similar systems. And so we just, plug in the ones we don't know, plutonium and uranium along that correlation, we can get uh, the short range or the minimum energy short range or uh, that represents short range order composition. And sure enough, we fit data and there's our fitted point and here's experimental values work, works really well. So we now have a correlation that can give us that kind of information. We do this different ways on different systems. So here's some results. The sodium potassium chromium chloride. Why do we care about chromium? Because it's the most susceptible component in structural alloys and molten salt reactors. Molten salt reactors are going to use high nickel alloys to uh, as structural materials. They need a bit of chromium in them. And however, chromium is the most, most susceptible to <laughs> So that's important. So here is our, our pseudo binary diagrams, or you know, they're not pseudo, they're isoplets. And you know, data, our model diagrams for chromium, so, uh, potassium chromium, sodium chloride, for the potassium chloride, chromium, potassium tubes, chromium CL4 and ACL diagrams. That, that, and also here, looking at a sodium potassium diagram with 20%, you fix 20% UCL4. So we can, do the, we can generate these kinds of phase diagrams. It tells the operators or builders of these, of these reactors what behavior is. When you know, you're running a reactor, you really don't want solids to precipitate. They go kind of clunk, clunk, clunk around in the reactor. So you want to stay in the melt region so you better stay above the liquidus. The other thing is you want to worry about corrosion. So you need information like what's the chromium chloride activity coefficient. And so here is our model in the lines and the data are circles. Darn good there. And here's the activity coefficient for uranium tetrachloride in, in the sodium potassium uranium tetrachloride system. Again, we are reproducing 
data that's available. Another application is computing vapor pressures. Here's uh, 1 over T versus log of the vapor pressure. And here's the temperatures up here. And so let's look at a 50-50 sodium chloride, potassium chloride salt. That's eutectic. So that would be a composition of interest. Let's throw in a little bit of uranium trichloride as fuel, a little bit of, a very little bit of uranium tetrachloride to control chlorine potential, fission product cesium chloride and cesium iodide. What are the vapor pressures? Turns out potassium and sodium chloride are the highest vapor pressures. Then we've got cesium chloride, potassium iodide. Why are those important? Cesium is a, is a volatile, highly radioactive fission product that is an environmental hazard. It's one of the major issues at Fukushima is that the ground is contaminated with cesium that was released from the reactor during the accident. Iodine is another one, highly volatile. It's a radiological hazard. Remember, people say, well, you have to take iodine tablets because reactors had an accident. That's what they're worried about, release of radioactive iodine. Why do you take iodine tablets? Because you've got a lot of iodine in your system. You're not going to absorb more. So you take iodine. It doesn't save you from cesium. <laughs> So these are this kind of information uh, provides information to the reactor operator. And, uh, are we what are the vapor pressures in the hit spaces within the reactor loop, and also for accident analysis, so the regulators can know what happens in an accident. Are we going to release amount of material? How much? Under what conditions? This is information for those kinds of analyses. Looking at corrosion, so here we've computed the molar concentrations of chromium chloride, iron chloride, and nickel chloride in this particular salt composition. And concentrations are pretty low. Again, here's the chromium chloride. That's the worst actor. Also, interestingly, not much temperature dependence. Um, kind of scratched your head and said, you know, that seems a little odd, but that's what the calculations tell us. And sure enough, our colleagues at Oak Ridge have done calculate, have done experiments and they scratch their heads. There's no temperature dependence. So it seems to be real. Here we looked at the fluoride systems. Here is the uh, fluorine potential, RT line of fluorine pressure. Is that really not the potential because you got to add the standard state free energy, but it doesn't matter. So here is, uh, for example, the, the effect of the ratio of UF3 to UF4, that controls the fluorine potential. UF3 to UF4 ratio in the reactor. So you need to have that sort of control in the reactor. Throw in one more UF3, reduces the, the fluorine potential. And so here is the, is the fluorine potential line for this variation in UF3 to UF4 ratio. And overlaying that are the thresholds for forming the fluorides. So this is the threshold for the for chromium plus fluorine to form chromium fluoride. If you're below this line, you've got chromium. You're good to go. Your alloy is not going to corrode. Above that line, you're forming chromium fluoride. It's leaching out into the salt, milk, and you're damaging your alloy. You're corroding your alloy. Here's chromium fluoride, difluoride to trifluoride line, iron, iron fluoride, et cetera. And interestingly, the, we're not doing the calculations for the elements. We have models for the alloys. What is the activity of chromium in the alloy? So we're make, doing these calculations using the rea realistic activity of chromium, for example, in the alloy. So you can get these, this kind of information from the systems. Right now, uh, we have released version 2.0 of our database. It has all these components and fluoride systems and all these chloride systems. I won't re read these all out to you, but already we have fairly, quite an extensive database. Started to add the reciprocal iodides as well. 
this is now publicly available. We, our most recent publication is thermodynamic assessment or reassessments of 30 pseudo-binary and ternary solar systems. One of the issues when, any, when you're doing things in the nuclear realm is being able to trace your information. The NRC is not interested in you telling them the answer is seven. <laughs> they want to know, how did you know that? Where did it come from? What's the arrow band on that? You know, who agrees with you? So we track every value that's in the database from the original pure compounds that are in the binary compounds, sodium fluoride, uranium fluoride, et cetera, uh, to the solution models. So in, in the documentation for the database, we are able to track every number and also the original numbers that we generate in our own assessments. And that's all documented for the user. Database follows the uh, FactSage ASCII 2 data file format. So it's actually, you can actually read it if, if you wanted to, but, uh, but it allows it to be used in open source codes like Thermochemica and Pi Calfet. And folks are taking this Thermochemica open source code, coupling it with other codes that model the reactor so that you can do thermodynamic calculations and determine states on the fly. Quality assurance is a problem. You're, you're getting data from all over the world, as well as your own values. <clears throat> so we do a QA check. Here is a document that's provided. Here's our computer diagram. Here's the one from the literature. And you can look at that and say, how good is that? In addition, Ontario Tech University, our colleagues there have developed an a automated QA QC system. And so they can flag things that are looking um, odd. So here's a CP measurement that doesn't quite jive. If you'd like it, get the, either of the databases or both, you apply at mstdd at ornl.gov. And you, get, you, can, you, get, you can get these uh, set of instructions, how to register for the database, and then download the database. It's at no cost, and there are no restrictions. You know, no restrictions for nationality. With maybe a couple, three exceptions, and there's no restriction with, with regard to uh, uh, where you're asking it from, from a, from what country, and your whether you're a, a government or private uh, organization. So if you have an interest in this, uh, you can get all that, the information as well as the databases that downloaded for your own efforts. What's next for us? We are trying to continue to expand the salt systems with iodine for both fluorides and chlorides for safety analysis. We'll do generate more systems with beryllium fluoride. Beryllium is very difficult to work with. It's considered extremely hazardous material. And so we don't do anything beryllium in our lab. Uh, some of the national labs are, and so we need, need them to generate data for us. We want to expand the database with, uh, again, chromium iron and nickel to better represent corrosion. And now we're also adding oxides, oxy, hydroxides, oxy, halide systems, because you need to know what happens if you have air leaks. Invariably, there will be some. How does the salt behave? Together with Penn State and Ontario Tech, we're trying to find ways to optimize things using automated systems, uh, that's, that's a really tough problem. A lot of these optimizations are take a long time because they are, you're basically manually fitting. There's no good way to compute them otherwise. And the other area working in is propagating uncertainties. Again, people wanna know, if you know the uncertainties in individual thermodynamic functions, now you've got a six component system, what's the uncertainty now? How do you propagate them into larger or higher order systems? So these are the folks who actually do the work. 
my group at University of South Carolina. We also work with Ontario Tech. And we're looking for new faculty, postdocs, and students. So if somebody comes and wants to come work with us, let me know. We have openings um, right at the moment. And we're supported by the Nuclear Advanced Modeling Simulation Program. It's one aspect, another aspect is the Molten Salt Reactor Program, and then the nu Nuclear Energy University programs uh, for the corrosion work. I talked a lot. Thanks a lot, Ted. Uh, first, let's throw the, the floor open to the folks on Zoom, Ankit uh, and other folks at ASU and anyone from UFA who have logged in. Give me a speed. You need to bring back the, uh, the little banners you can see in the chat. Okay. Um, can you? How do I do that? Do you have how how do I get them back? Escape. Escape? Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, there it is. And, and I have to do what? Yeah, that, that just runs out of Yeah. It's, it's not necessary to use it. Guys, we can't hear you. So uh, I remember the original uh, molten salt program at Oak Ridge uh, plagued by pretty bad corrosion problems uh, with nickel-based alloys. Have you got experimental data yet on uh, using newer alloys to uh, reduce the corrosion problem? Or are you still... Uh, Involved strictly in theoretical calculations. No, there there are uh, both at Oak Ridge and elsewhere. There are uh, both static and loop tests going on. Okay. To uh, determine both the kinetics and and the and the processes of corrosion. Right. And I don't know that uh, there's that much alloy development as opposed to trying to understand corrosion and mitigate it. It turns out chromium chloride, chromium fluorides are, are fairly insoluble in the presence of the metal in the salts. So I don't know that uh, it's going to be that big a problem if you can control the halide potential. It becomes much more of a problem if you've got water and moisture or, or oxygen present uh, and things get out of hand. But uh, uh, so that's still a, a lot of effort going into understanding corrosion and choice of alloys. The uh, industry really would like to use 316 stainless, mm -hmm. at least for the chlorides. Okay. All right, thanks. Audience, any questions? It's, uh, yeah. Oh, can you see what? what? Yeah, if you can use that keyboard just pull up the chat and go see that question. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Yuri. Where are the biggest technology? Yeah, can you hear me? Well, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Thank you very much for the very nice talk. And uh, I have a question related to the technology uh, development in general of molten salt reactors. How do you see what will be or what are currently the biggest challenges of uh, this technology to be embraced by market or uh, society? What should we solve, let's say, in the first place to, to make this uh, technology viable and uh, available for society? Uh, there, there are two issues. Uh, the first is uh, licensing. The nuclear regulatory has never seen a molten salt reactor they have to license. You know, and, you know, they're, they're used to the fuel staying put. When the, when the fuel's a liquid, things are really bad in a, in a light water reactor. Here we're starting with the fuel as a liquid, but they're, they're coming up to speed pretty quick. We're working with, uh, among others, are, are working with uh, uh, the NRC and providing information. There's a, a reactor code called MELCOR that's used in safety analysis by the NRC. And we're uh, working to provide our database to MELCOR for calculations. So licensing is a big one. If it's gonna take 20 years to license one of these, the technology's dead. So we'll have to see what happens if, if the NRC is up, up for it. 
I know they would like to be, but second is cost, 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 cost. How much is it gonna cost to get electricity from one of these things? Uh, the venture capitalists who are funding these now from Bill Gates to people never heard of, uh, they're betting that we can make these things economically viable. I have no crystal ball, I don't know, but that's the problem. You know, if you, you'd be, I got to be able to deliver the electricity at a cost that's probably need, gonna have to be competitive with natural gas because that's the standard these days. And I, I don't know, uh, you know, this country world should be giving a premium to these non-carbon producing technologies and not letting them fight against natural gas, but they don't. And so that's, that's the market. So I would say those two things, getting over the regulatory hurdle and there's progress going on. And can you really build them to deliver electricity at a reasonable cost? So and this may even be tangential, but is there a specific reason why we use uranium chlorides uh, in this? Uranium fluoride versus uh, what? So, no, go ahead. I, oh, I, okay. Now I can have questions. Yeah. Um, I have lots of questions. Yeah, go ahead. We'll do. So you mentioned about the Oak Ridge had a molten salt reactor, but you you said it hasn't been running. So there you don't have any like active reactors that are molten salt reactors. Uh, like, there is um, research reactors. Or? No. Oh. The. Uh, <clears throat> uh, TerraPower with Oak Idaho National Laboratory will be building a uh, test system, critical test system at Idaho National Lab over the next three, four years. Okay. And they've already started work. And uh, they, they call it McCree, the molten chloride reactor experiment. Okay. Um, but there is no molten salt reactor operating and none has since uh, MSRE shut down. Um. But well, my I have some questions kind of on like how it would operate as it's not operating now. But um, you mentioned like the molten salt, the fuels in the molten salt is also like the coolant and the moderator fuel like all in one. It's not the moderator. Okay, so it's it's moderate graphite. Uh, it, yes. Okay. The, the the thermal reactors will use graphite as moderator. Yeah. So what happened, and that's what the molten salt reactor experiment did. Yeah. They had a. Uh, a uh, essentially a graphite block with holes in it and yeah. the that's how oh, maybe a little more complicated than that yeah. and then the and the salt just flowed through so you have like graphite and then the like ink canal and then the fuel or what's that um no you've got a pot the yeah. ink canal well it's not ink canal it's the Hasselolloy or stainless okay. you got a pot in the pot sits a, uh, a matrix of graphite you know that the salt can flow through okay. and it flows through there. The diameter is enough so that you can get a critical system. You can sustain a chain reaction. Why is, does the diameter have to be big enough? Anybody know? What do you mean? No. Have we got any nuclear engineers in the, in the audience? Why does it have to be big enough? For the startup reaction, the neutrons, how many neutrons? Surface to volume ratio. <laughs> I don't you, think you don't want the neutrons, too many neutrons to escape out right. into the world. So the larger the volume, less likelihood the neutrons are going to escape because the surface area to volume goes down with size. So you got a big area, <clears throat> sustained sustain chain reaction, graphite, there's the moderator. Same is true of fast reactor. Don't need a moderator, but you still need the volume. Yeah. And then you go down to a pipe, no more chain reaction. Don't have a critical assembly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm used to like pressurized water reactors, which I guess is obviously more common, but- um, Same problem though. Yeah. In that, in that case though, enough. you have like the water is the moderator and the coolant and it's always solid. Well, it's liquid, solid reactor, but- um, you were mentioning with the salt that you get um, like gas, like the xenon as like a gas product. So do you have like a combination 
of liquid and gas and like solid you're talking about all the different phases they could form is you hope not a, okay you, know, yeah, so you, you don't you don't want that you control that based on like the operating temperature to make sure it stays all liquid but not like in between with all the That's different the, reactions happening thermodynamics tells you don't go below this temperature and you're gonna have above. solids don't do that so and inert gases are inert gases they're not you know there's gonna have be some solubility within salt uh, people are trying to understand that but they're also going to be, uh, you know, as it circulates, there will be um, sort of volumes in which you can you can remove the, the, those gases because you you don't want you don't want two phase flow. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you, you want to remove the, those gases. Also, uh, there are neutron absorbers. So neutron, I mean, the whole thing's neutrons. Yeah, you're you're, you're spending a lot of money on neutrons. You don't want to lose them to xenon. You yeah. want them to be fission. That was actually another question. Fission. I was going to ask: Is there so like want, want to remove the gas? Built, is there poison built into the reactor with the molten salt, or is it controlled and like control? They'll, rods they'll have control them? rods. Okay. More conventional yes, control rods. Cool. If they need a burnable poison, they can throw it in there. Yeah, because I was curious how, like, obviously with a solid fuel, you will have a certain like ratio of like how you use up the fuel, and you can control that with poison. But when it's liquid, I was it's even easier. Yeah, okay, that's what I thought it might be, but I'm not sure how. Yeah, sure. Okay. Put, put poison in there, have a, a, a take off an aliquot, you know, clean it up, put it back, you know, it, you know it's take some of the salt out. So, uh, so you can do things like refueling, yeah. controlling uh, reactivity all on the fly. Yeah. How do they do, um, like, deal with the spent fuel? Um, that's another question. It's <laughs> not been far, far from resolved. And then yeah. that's, people just starting to look at that. Yeah. And you can ask that same question about LWR. Yeah. Well, I actually, I worked with spent fuel disposal for a little bit. I, I worked at any of the reactors. I don't know if you've worked with them at all. Uh, many years ago. Yeah. Many years ago on, on some things. So, at, yeah. We are at uh, Bettis or Capital. I worked at Nail Reactors headquarters in DC as oh, okay. the Navy. Okay, so we've but I've been to both. <laughs> I've been to both Venice and Capital. We'll put miles. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know that's something. You're gonna do. One thing nice about the molten salt reactors is that people, for example, Argonne National Laboratories and Los Alamos, not Los Idaho, been worked for many years on using molten salts for reprocessing fuel. Mm -hmm. It's already molten salt. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, fuel processing will be a lot easier. We can remove. Bad actors concentrate them, and yeah, those can be nuclear waste. It's a reactor. I'll, I'll stop taking everybody's okay. time. I have lots of Madam, could you explain a little bit more how that QA QC tool works, and is it available to the public? Uh, I, I, I'll send you the report on it. Uh, it it should be because you, your taxpayer may, might pay for it. Um, this one, yes. This is done by Ontario Tech, <clears throat> and and what they've done is, so for example, here they pick uh, solubility test and the element lithium, and uh, and which database to look at, and they basically uh, look at the comparison between the data in on solubility and what the uh, Thermodynamic calculations tell them this is solubility. So you, you pick the process, you pick the property and the system, and it goes and checks how does the complete, how do the thermodynamic calculation results compare to data? Yeah. Any questions? No. I'll probably ask you over lunch. Okay. Some of the, because we, we've done some work on internally uh, and quaternary molten salt. And I think it's cool. That's quite right. well, well, we love, you, love to steal your data. Yeah, no, I, I, we have a research professor here uh, who, who did lots of the database. Uh, maybe he's around, I, I can try setting up a meeting on the same thing. Uh, any any other questions, guys? Uh, okay, maybe uh, anyone in the audience, please, in the Zoom on Zoom. Um, 
Yeah, there's a, yeah, go ahead. Hi, so um, wonderful talk. First of all, thank you so much for the sharing. Um, so I myself also work on molten salts, but definitely not like um, these uh, more corrosive parts. I'm just curious um, when you guys des design the kind of the system, um, do you guys um, seal it when it's running? And when it's like, how do you guys seal it? Like with um, some special gasket or, um, I'm just curious about how, how is it running the molten salt reactor? Um, yeah, I mean, it's gotta be a gas tight. First of all, you don't want any vapors coming off. Secondly, you don't want any oxygen and moisture to get inside. Um, so yeah, it has, you know, and when we do our research with uh, the salts, we have a, a high, very high purity glove box in which we manipulate the salts and get them ready for testing. Our differential scanning calorimeter uses a stainless steel uh, crucible that is gas tight. And we put a nickel liner in it because we're concerned that the, the, uh, some of the salts will attack the stainless steel. And so that's gas tight. So we prepare the samples in a in this glove box, and then you can take them out into the air. But yeah, salts, air, and moisture, they don't go together. They ruin the properties of the salts. Uh, it doesn't take much exposure. And so the, it does have to be uh, isolated from the environment. And also we need to understand you know, more what, what those kind of contaminants do. So that's part of our work. Um, yeah. I see. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, indeed, they are really hygroscopic and um, the atmosphere just mess up everything. So <laughs> it's yeah. really hard to work with them. <laughs> now that, that's what we, that's, we melt, we measure the melting points of all our salts. So you, you, you order an anhydrous chromium chloride salt from one of these uh, uh, commercial houses and they say, oh, nine, three nines purity, you know, and it, it shows up. And you know you get the melting point; it's seventy-five degrees off. And then you find out three nines means well, we don't have any metals in there. <laughs> They're not telling you anything about oxygen or moisture, or so that you know basically it's unusable. Mm -hmm. And and cleaning up salts, is, especially fluoride salts, is extremely difficult. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, that's a huge problem. Thank you. Any, okay, I think we need to close the day. I think it's very close to the o'clock and Andrew is going to last now. So let's talk, uh, thank uh, Dr. Bestman once again for a great job here. Uh, he's going to be here for, uh, later this evening. So if you ever want to talk to him, uh,